Great to see everybody. Hopefully, uh, yeah, it was good to see you here. Hope you came ready to learn, to grow, to sing, and just to spend time together. Let's stand. Uh, oh, thanks for joining us <laughs> and joining us online. All right. I think uh, uh, this is great, you know, like uh, rattle, right? We hear this, this, uh, this idea of dead is dead, but not with God. Not with God. And Saturday was silent. Surely it was through. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? Amen. Oh, Friday's disappointment was Sunday's empty tomb. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? Oh, this is the sound of dry bones rattling. Yeah, this is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Well, this is the sound of drop bones rattling. Come on! Yeah, a Pentecostal fire. It's stirring something new. But you're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon. Oh, resurrection power turns in my veins too. Yeah, well, I believe there's another miracle here in this room. Well, this is the sound of trombones rattling. Oh, this is the praise maker, dead man walk again. God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to do. Just ask the man who was thrown on the bones of Elijah. If there's anything that he can do. Well, just ask the stone.
don't know what grave you might be in today, but today, let's come out of that grave in Jesus' name. We could sing that all day long. Am I alone? Okay, okay, awesome. I'm like, yes, Jesus, that is so exciting news. Well, welcome. How are you? Good. That whole song just encouraged my heart. It's like, yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that with you, every day is new. Mercies are new. And you know what? We have been through a long period of difficulty. That does not negate what Jesus can do. Hallelujah. Amen. We serve a God that can do anything. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Pastor Robin. Will you join me and let's pray? I know you're standing. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. Lord, you fill our hearts with hope when the world tells us there is no hope. You fill our hearts with joy. And Jesus, that is because you paid such a high price for all of us to have a relationship. Thank you, God. Thank you that we can do that today. Thank you, Lord, that there is no prayer request, there is no concern of our heart that is bigger than you. And we thank you, Lord. Today we want to lift those to you. We think of Lisa and Paz, Sean, David, Carl and Maria, Elaine, Father, and many, many more. You know exactly what their situation is. And we ask you, Lord, to comfort them with your presence, to fill their heart with joy and hope and peace. And Lord, help us today. As we sing truth about you, as we hear truth about you proclaimed, Father, let it go deep into our hearts. We want to be transformed into the image of Jesus because there's a community to love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Great to have you. Um, Like I mentioned, I'm Pastor Robin. It's awesome to have you here. If you're visiting with us, welcome. It's great to have you. I do want to just share with you a few things to help you relax. You know, it's different. Every time you go to a new church, they do things just a little bit differently. Um, You may notice that when we're in worship, there may be people around you who raise their hands. Or don't raise their hands. There's no right or wrong way to worship. But it's really important that we worship. Amen? Amen. So even as a visitor, I invite you to jump into worship. The other thing I want to let you know is um, you're going to see people on either side of the platform. That is our prayer team. And if you've got a concern on your heart or something that you would like to join in prayer with, please, during worship, head over there. They would love to pray with you. I also want to let you know there's a great bunch of sources to get some information to find out just what's going on at church. If you happen to be in the building, um, back in that area is a hard copy bulletin and a bunch of stuff that's coming up is in the bulletin for you to know. If you are joining us online or want to reference it later in the week, you can go to our website realchurch.org, and all of that information is on there. You're also, if you're on the website, you're going to see a connect button. If you would complete that, fill that out, just let us know that you were here. We would just love to know that you were visiting with us. Sound good? Where are you going to go for more information? Okay. You can always call the office. You can look it up on the web, realchurch.org, or you can get our really fancy app, or you can even get your bulletin right to your phone, however it works for you. So, Maranatha, will you join me? Let's give our visitors a really warm welcome. That was very funny. You guys are so funny. I do want to highlight this week, Robert Parks sent in a great picture for the bulletin. So, Robert, thank you for sending that in. If you would like your super cool picture to be featured on our bulletin, we would love to do that. Please send that in, and uh, they'll get that in the queue for our bulletin. So, very, very cool. Um, A few announcements to share with you. Today, I know you've been anxiously waiting for this wonderful spaghetti dinner, and today it's here. So, after service, you can get a spaghetti dinner for $10 with a variety of either meat or not meat, and all the proceeds go to supporting our karate ministry and their ministry trip over to Maui. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. 
they got to go to Maui. But no, wonderful opportunity. So that's a great way to support it and get a great lunch. I also want to let you know some great news. Pastor Tina and Pastor Gail were able to extend the registration deadline for snow days. So it's not too late to get your kids registered and to get a T-shirt. So please do that today. Um, Yeah, by today. That would be awesome. If you need more information, where do you go? Realchurch.org. You guys are so good. I love it. Okay. So Wild Game tickets are on sale in the lobby because Wild Game is happening this Friday night. Friday night, Friday, Friday, Friday. Can't believe it is this Friday. I know. So exciting. It really is. It, It is this Friday. Gentlemen, this is an event for guys. Every once in a while, the ladies always ask, well, can I come? Well, only if you dress like a guy. No, I, I'm just kidding. You know, we always do have some women show up. They come incognito. Uh, they kind of they kind of hide a little bit because it really is advertised and billed as a men's event. Uh, but some women do show up. We don't ask you to leave. We just ask you to be quiet. You do not. Wow. <laughs> For goodness sake. We, you know, uh, just don't just don't get in our way. It's it's kind of our our deal, you know. Is the the, the men. Oops. The hole you're digging, it's getting the hole bigger I'm digging all the time. Is getting bigger? bigger all the time. Just Trying to saying. save me from digging a hole. I'm just saying. Anyway, it, it really is going to be a lot of fun, gentlemen. Hopefully, you are you've invited some friends. You're planning on coming because it really is a great time. And you know, it's these kind of events that you know there there's a little bit of witness. We like to let our light shine, but it's not about that. It's about Letting people know that just because you're committed, you love God with all your heart, doesn't make you a stick in the mud, doesn't make you boring, doesn't make you unrelatable, doesn't make you a real person. Amen. Amen? I mean, I think so many times people think that, well, well, you're, you're, one, of those, you're one of those born again types. That means you're dead, dull, and boring. Not true. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Man, we could go out and kill things. Like, you know, I mean, kill animals. Bigger hole. Bigger hole. Yep. <laughs> anyway, it's coming up. It's this Friday. You need to make plans. Uh, be telling your friends. Show up. This can be the place to be. Food's going to be marvelous. And I'll see you this Friday. Buy tickets. And you can buy tickets at the door. You can buy tickets at the door. You can buy tickets yeah. online. You can buy tickets out there in the lobby today. They got it covered. Yes. Our guest speaker, he's got a book that I have kind of thumbed through and read it. It is just amazing. He is a local guy right here in Forest Lake. Some of you will know Alan Bakken. Uh, he is, I never realized he is a hunter extraordinaire. He has been around the world. And anyway, he is looking forward to being here with us. So that's it uh, this Friday. Amen. This Friday. Sounds good. Get your tickets. It'll be great. Ladies, I want to let you know. What time? Whatever time what it says time? on the Four. four. Is oh. it four? Oh. Four o'clock. Dinner's four o'clock. at five. Doors open at four. Doors open at four. Doors open at four. Awesome. Good. Thank you, Dylan. Ladies Dylan knows come what's at going seven. on. Awesome. <laughs> Something's happening and I don't know what it is. And that's okay. Okay, so ladies, I want to let you know, um, this coming Saturday, we have our women's breakfast, and we are privileged to be able to hear from Jamie Fairbanks, which is a ball of fun energy. I just love her to pieces. And Heather Green is going to be cooking. So please grab your girlfriends and come on. That's this Saturday. We do have a few new classes that are starting. Pastor Tina is going to be doing a Parenting 101 class. (laughs) Again, something happened. Okay, parenting class coming up on the 22nd. Um, Friday, women's Bible study. They're going to be doing a new study, Rachel and Leah. I also want to let you know that the giving statements are on their way, so those should be coming to you, so watch your email. Look for the spam folder, because sometimes that happens. And that's it. I know that was a whole lot, but join me. Let's listen to Pastor Mike and Breaking Stereotypes. Welcome to Breaking Stereotypes. Breaking stereotypes because some people think this is political. Yeah, not really. This is foundational to understanding our history as a nation. You know, when we first uh, broke away from England, taxes were kind of a big deal. We were tired of the king telling us what to do. Um, Also, the religious freedom. So it's kind of interesting that we keep revisiting and stirring up our foundation. For if a foundation crumbles, 
of anything, it's gonna crumble. Today might be a little challenging. Thomas Jefferson, for soon we will have to labor 16 hours in the 24. Give the earnings of 15 of these to the government for their debts and expenses. And the 16th hour will be insufficient to afford bread. We will live on oatmeal and potatoes. We will have no time to think, no means of calling the mismanagers to account. We will be glad only to obtain substance by hiring ourselves out to rivet chains on the necks of our fellow sufferers. Was, he was pretty bold. He was pretty challenging to, hey, America, wake up. Something to think about. I know. Wow. Wow. Something to think about, something to pray about, something to vote about. Um, let's take a few minutes and join one another. Let's greet each other. Uh, go introduce yourself to someone you haven't met yet, and then we'll move into worship. Thanks. Man, we serve a God who is alive. We serve a God who can bring back to life the dead. So I think we just need to re-proclaim. Proclaim again. <laughs> that we will speak to those dry bones. And we'll say, live. 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 The dry bones hear the word of the Lord. thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you're bringing us alive. God, we thank you that you continue to work on us. I thank you, Jesus, that you are our King, our Lord, our Savior. We thank you, Jesus. There is a King seated among us. Let every heart receive Him now. And where there is praise, he will inhabit and there will be grace and mercy all around and every burden will be lifted in his presence and every trophy will be laid down at his feet there is a name that reigns above all Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. And unto the Lamb, glory and honor, oh, worthy is He who overcame and buried in shame. But risen in power, he is alive, the stone is rolled away, and all our worship will be lost to him forever, and death is conquered, and our Savior holds the key. There is a name that reigns above all. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. And it won't be long till we will behold Him. And every tear He'll wipe away. We'll be at home. The war will be over. We will meet our Savior face to face. Every burden and every burden will be lifted in His presence. 
Jesus, you don't know me anything oh, more than anything that you can do. But I just want you. Oh, I just want you, Lord. Oh, there's nothing else, nothing else, oh, Lord. My heart cry out to you, Jesus. Oh, can we just sing it? I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. Well, I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. One more time. And I just want you. Come on, tell him. Nothing else. Oh, nothing else. And nothing else will do. Hallelujah. Can we sing this? Because our God is an awesome God. He reigns. From heaven above with the wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God, come on, is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with the wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome Come on, with our God. An awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with a wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Hallelujah! Jesus, we thank you, Lord. God, we praise you. Lord, God, may our heart cry out to you, Jesus. May our heart cry out to you, Lord, that in the midst of chaos, in the midst of anything that we're going through, Lord, that our hearts, Lord, would seek you like David. God, that our heart, that our heart would seek you more than life itself. God, can we sing just this? I, I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. Even when I don't feel it, I just want you, nothing else, nothing else. Nothing else will. Even when the troubles come and the trials, I just want you. Oh, nothing else. Nothing else. Even when it's going good, nothing else. Nothing else will do. Because I just want you. Nothing else. Oh, nothing else. Nothing else will do. Last week, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Abram was told he's going to make, God was going to make a great nation out of him. And he was discouraged because he wasn't having kids. And he was discouraged. And God shows up and he says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Sometimes we keep looking for things from God and we get disappointed because we're, we're seeking his hand instead of his face 
We want what he can give us instead of receiving himself. Lord, forgive us for the times we have sought your hand and we have not sought your face. Amen. I love that. God says, I am your exceeding reward. Praise God. You may be seated. God is good. Okay, I want to read just one more thing. I wanted to read it like that first Sunday of the new year, but it slipped by my memory, and I'm thinking it's still, it's still pretty funny. And um, I just want to turn. My brother Tom, he sent me uh, a text, okay? And earlier, the earlier text before, before this, um, he talked about how much he loves us and blessings. And then about 10 minutes later, we get this. It's 11, 10, 11 p.m. on New Year's Eve, and that's what we get. I know we don't, this is just to me and my brothers. I know we don't talk about finances or wealth ever, but please don't think I'm bragging when I say this, but I'm very, very confident I can live comfortably the rest of the year. <laughs> my brother Tom, he's got such a great, dry sense of humor. He's a funny guy. He is able to see the humor in, in so much of life when it's even dismal. And um, man, I, I, was, I was rolling. I was laughing my head off. And, but as I... But as I um, read that and reflected, even at this time during offering, when we think of missions, we give to missions this morning. We also, as we just give, really what he said there was, I I'm trusting God. I I'm going to make it, you know, to the end of the year. Well, even if this year began, I think with the same sense of confidence, he's, he's confident that through the power and the grace, our faith in our Savior, I'm going to make it to this next year. Amen. Praise God. Father, we come to you now remembering, Lord, your grace and your mercy. Father, we think of Bob McKay and, and the request that he has for us. Father, that they would start a radio program for there to be new churches started. Father, for homes for the refugees, as there is so much uh, of the need for that in that country. Father, we ask for your grace. Father, may you, your right arm, that's just, which is never shortened, Meet every need according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God is good all the time. Abundantly free in 2023. John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's the only, he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, Jesus said, that you might have life and have it abundantly. Have it abundantly. I'm going to tell you a Hasseltine testimony a little bit later. I, I made allusion to it a couple weeks ago, I, I think. Um, but I'm going to tell you the whole story. Because whenever I reflect on it, I am so grateful that Jesus changed our lives and allowed us to live an abundant life. I mean, I personally think that if it wasn't for salvation, Jesus coming into our family, I wouldn't be here. I mean, and if I was alive, I'd be in jail. You know, the Bible says in Revelation 12, 11, that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. God is good. All the time. I want to begin, though, by just laying a, a, a slight or little foundational encouragement. Uh, Matthew Chapter 13, verse 33. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. One sentence, one verse, where basically Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. This glorious message when it is proclaimed, it permeates everything. It permeates. It affects. It says here, Jesus says, in fact, it leavened the whole lump. As they mix it in, it, it affects everything. Both for good and bad. Because some people aren't too excited when they hear the gospel message. Amen? Amen. John chapter 1. Verses 35 through 42, John 1, 35 through 42. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. 
And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. So you got John the Baptist standing there with two of his disciples. Jesus walks by and he goes, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. That's why, praise God, John had the right attitude. He must increase while I decrease. Amen? It's all about Jesus. When Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, what do you want? What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi or teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. So you have Andrew following John. John says, there's the Lamb of God. Andrew goes and follows him, and after hanging out with Jesus, realizes, hey, guess what? This is the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah. What's the first thing he does? He goes and tells his brother, a rough fisherman. We will get to know him later as time unfolds, won't we? The impetuous Peter. So he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas which is also translated Peter or a small stone. When Andrew saw Jesus, the first thing he did was he went and told his brother. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 27. This is uh, the story of the woman at the well. The woman at the well is there. Jesus is there talking. The disciples go in town. You're familiar with the story. They go in town to get some food. They come back and they see him sitting there at the well talking to, number one, a woman, but not just a woman, a Samaritan woman. I mean, this is just unheard of. And here Jesus is sitting there talking to her. And it, it says in another place that you know nobody ever asks him, hey, what are you doing? Because he's Jesus. You know, like we're as if we're going to question him. Oh, wait a minute. We do all the time. God, what are you doing? Okay, just another message for another time. (laughs) At this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. Verse 42. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Upon meeting him, she went and told everybody in the city, and everybody in the city said, well, let's go listen to this guy. And then they believed. Acts chapter 16. Paul uh, has been arrested. Uh, He's in jail, and him and Silas are in jail, and they're commanded not to talk about Jesus, not in the name of Jesus. Uh, They've been beaten and put in prison. And you're familiar with the story. We're in Acts chapter 16, and... Back then, when the Roman Praetorian Guard are in charge of the jails, if anybody gets out or escapes, it will cost them their life, okay? So, big earthquake, all of a sudden, the prisons are opened, and again, real quick review. The keeper of the prison walking, verse 27, and the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he could kill himself with a whole lot less pain and more efficiency than the death that was going to be awaiting him. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm. We are all here. 
Then he called for a light. He ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Okay, let's just pause there just for a quick second. Why do you think that would be the first question out of his mouth? Why do you think? He knew he was going to die. That's, that's true, but there's something else I'm looking for. Why would that have been the first question he would have asked Paul and Silas? Uh, okay, say that again. Saw the earthquake after they were praising the Lord. We're getting really close. Because I think that's part of it. They what? I can't hear that clearly enough back there. They, he listened to them all night long. And what were they talking about? No, you guys don't know human nature good enough. Paul was saying, Silas, it's all your fault. We're here. <laughs> Silas was, no, you cast the demon out of that woman. What in the world were you thinking? It's your fault that we're here. If God really loved us, why are we here? God, well, I'm not sure what's going to happen to my faith because this ain't the way I expected it to go. So he heard their complaining all night long and wanted to know about their victorious faith. Oh, you don't believe that's the way it went? Not me either. I don't either. I'm just being a little sarcastic there. I think all night long they heard him talking about the glorious things of God. They're talking about Paul probably recounting his story. Hey, I remember, Silas. I tell you what, man, wherever this ends up, it doesn't matter because I was on my way to hell and he knocked me off my horse. He revealed himself to me, his great love and mercy and compassion. I was once an enemy of the cross, an enemy, enemy of Jesus, but now he, out of his grace, rescued me. Oh, God is so good. So they were carrying on about the goodness of God. Hey, do you remember the last tent meeting we had back in Lystra? Man, that was great. We got stoned, thrown out of the city, but praise God, people got saved. Amen? They're talking about the good things of God. The jail is there. He sees no one there. He's going to kill himself. Paul says, don't do it. And he finally, he, first thing he says to them is, what must I do to be saved? I want what you have. And they were in prison. So they said, verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, friends, I want you to know that, especially, I think, evangelical Pentecostal types, they have misquoted this verse or they've misused this verse so long. I've heard people say, well, well if you give your life to the Lord, that means that your whole family is going to get saved because it's for you and your family, you and your household. That's not what that verse means. You will be saved. And anybody else who believes this message. It's available for everybody in your house. It's not just for you. It's not a guarantee that, well, if you get saved, your whole family's going to get saved. No, you need to share the good news with them, which is exactly what he does. He brings Paul and Silas home with him. He is so excited about this faith that he witnessed in front of him is now experiencing through faith. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. He and all his family were baptized. Well, you don't baptize unbelievers. You believe and then you get baptized. So they all believe. So guess what? He and his whole household was saved. It's exciting stuff. It was just a couple weeks ago, um, our youngest son, Max, um, who's, you know, been through a long struggle, still struggles. Um, him and I have been spending quite a bit of time together lately over the holidays, and a lot of reasons, both good and bad. 
but he was with me, in, I was at the shop, uh, the church shop, and we're hanging out there, and some guys were there, and we're having lunch, and I, I told him the story of how, how Christianity came into the Hasseltine family. I get done telling the story, and Max looks at me, and he goes, I've never heard that. I didn't know that. I was talking about even my dad, his grandpa, you know, when he used to smoke and, uh, you know, he was, he, he'd drink. Because our youngest son, one of his things is, you know, you guys live so clean. You, you know, there was no smoking. There was no drinking. There was no, you guys, you guys, you guys were weird. But he said, I never heard that. And then in a comment that I didn't really expect to come out of him, he said, Dad, just think of the thousands of people's lives that have been changed because of that experience. I'm going to tell you the story because I think it's a great story. I literally think about it several times a year that um, they were a good family. I mean, kind of. We all were. We were religious, you know, went to church every Sunday, but didn't have a relationship with Christ. And we'd have been lost if it wasn't for God's grace in this situation. Um, I actually come equipped with some pictures. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures of my, my grandpa, my dad's dad. Okay, so this first picture, that is a picture of my grandpa. Uh, you can see it's September 1958. My mom and dad were married in 1958. Um, what month? What, what month? April 26th. The reason I say that is because I was born in September, and I want everybody to know that it was way more than nine months. Um, so I have in the past told you um, that my mom comes from a different style of family than my mom, than my dad. Okay. And you can, yeah, amen. And you, and you can see a little glimpse of it right here. Okay. So what happens, my mom and dad, they were uh, living in Arlington, uh, Virginia, right? Is that right? Arlington, Virginia. They got married out there, you, well, you got married in Lawrence at, at the big church there. And anyway, so for their honeymoon, they came out to Wisconsin to visit Doug's, you know, my dad's side of the family. Now, what's really interesting is none of his brothers and sisters showed up to see them. But they stopped at his parents' place. Uh, they lived on Marshall Avenue in St. Paul. Marshall Avenue. And I remember as, as a young kid going there and, and playing and messing around. It was kind of fun. They had, a, they had a big porch off in the front of their house with these big concrete, like, pillars with a, you know, big concrete ledge and stone and brick house uh, right there in, in St. Paul. Um, it, was, it was cool. I, I remember it. But you can see that, okay, so they're there on the honeymoon. Now, my mother, dressed in her finery, is meeting her in-laws for the first time. This is their honeymoon. Do you see terror on my mother's face? There's a little, there's a little bit of the, what did I get myself into? Okay, there's a little bit of that going on. I just want to be honest, okay? Uh, because this family here, they, they were a little rough. Little, little rough, okay? So, uh, next picture. Now she's really uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, grandma and grandpa um, have squeezed in. Uh, Dad obviously is taking the picture. And there he is. Now, I did not remember my grandpa being this, this young. Um, I, you'll see pictures later, right before he died. And, and that's what I have memories of my grandfather. You know, just being a, just a wonderfully kind old man. Um, I see him in pictures like this and I go... He's a thug. <laughs> or has the potential to be one. 
I mean, when I look and I see that picture, I go, there's a tough guy. You know, and, and, and I've heard stories that, you know, after on payday, grandma would have to go down to the bar to make sure to get some money before he spent it all, you know. And just, just a rough kind of character. Uh, he worked up on the Alaska Pipeline. Um, I, I would not want to mess with this dude right here. Okay. Um, let me show you another picture. I think it's a picture of the whole family. I'm not sure. Let's, let's see what we got going on here. Yeah, this is... Uh, my grandma and grandpa's family. So there's my grandpa, my grandma, Alda, Earl and Alda. And then there is uh, the oldest. Uh, no, Betty Lou is not here. Betty Lou is not in this picture. Uh, my dad comes from a family of six kids. Okay. I hope you're going to enjoy this story because I'm, I'm just telling you a story. So there's the, the next oldest, Uncle Chuck. Uncle Chuck. I realized that uh, Uncle Chuck, some of his kids watch uh, the, the service, so welcome to you guys. I hope you're enjoying this as well. So there's Uncle Chuck, his wife, Faith Ann. Um, I took my very first steps as a baby, nine months old, when Auntie Faith Ann was watching me. I was standing there. She scared the jeepers out of me, and I took off. No, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So th- th- there was, uh, there's Guy Raven. Um, or Gwen. Um, and then there's my dad and my mother in the group. Then there's my Aunt Shirley and her husband, Don. And then there's Uncle Eldie. Uh, he was the race car driver. And his wife, Pat. So, and then there's the baby, uh, Faith, Ann, Faith Ann, Babe. Everybody called her Babe. Uh, her name is Faith Ann. Um, and Betty Lou looked a lot like Grandma, but she is not in this picture. But that, does that look like a rough crowd? Or do they look a lot like your in-laws and your outlaws? Do they look a lot like, does it look a lot like your family? Yeah? Okay, next picture. Let's see what we got going on here. Okay, so this is a picture, of obviously, of my grandpa and my father. My dad is leaving for the military. Um, He was stationed in Okinawa. He worked for the intelligence department service in the military. Um, They put him, as soon as he tested, they said, wow, this guy is above average intelligence, uh, probably just a little shy of a genius, and we need him in the the intelligence uh, area because the Army doesn't have much intelligence. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Relax. Relax. So there's a picture of them, uh, you know, leaving. And, and again, I would not want to mess with this dude. I just, man, I wouldn't want to mess with him. Okay, last picture, and then I'm going to tell the story. So there's my aunt, uh, Betty Lou. So she was the oldest. Then there's Uncle Chuck. Um, and then there's my dad, of course, the, the baby, Faith Ann. This is Karen. We celebrate the same birthday on September 9th. Just I'm two years ahead of her. Okay, and that is... Uh, Betty Lou's daughter, Karen. So this is gram- grandma, grandpa. I don't know what the deal is, birth date or, or whatever, but the date on the picture, you can't see it. It's April 1970. Okay? Um, he looks like a happy guy. It's because he's a Christian. See, he died shortly after this. He died in like 1970, early 71, somewhere in there. I can't remember exactly. Mom and dad don't remember exactly either, but... But that's the guy I remember. Let me tell you a story. The family I just showed you, I I tease you about being ruffians. Well, kind of were, but you know something? Probably most of you live this way too. You're kind of, in some ways or another, your family's kind of rough, whatever. I mean, there was no gospel. No, they went to church. But there was no faith in Jesus. There was no radical conversion. There's no radical change in their life. You know, did they go to church? Yeah, they went to church once in a while. Were they good moral people? Yeah, probably as good as some of you (laughs) were. You get the picture? They're just, they're just people. Just people living. Without Jesus, that's just kind of what you do. You do the best and you, you do your thing. And My grandma and grandpa were uh, Lutheran 
and we were raised Catholics, so when we would go and spend time with them uh, in the summertime, uh, they would literally drive us to the Catholic church, drop us off, let us go into the Catholic church. Because if, you know, if you're Catholic, you, you don't dare go into any other church because Catholics are the only ones going to heaven. Okay? I mean, that's just, that's just well known. You know that. That's true. And, and then, so my grandma and grandpa, they were Lutheran. Now, so they went to their Lutheran church. And, and if you're raised Lutheran, you know that, that Catholics, you know, Lutherans believe that Catholics don't have it all together. You know, that, that Lutherans are going to go to heaven too. Right? <laughs> I, I'm just messing with you. My grandma and grandpa bought a cottage out on Lake, Mud Lake in Chautauqua, Wisconsin. And I remember with, again, great fondness, my grandpa... And Grandma would take Kevin and I for two weeks every summer. And we'd hang out there. Uh, Grandpa was at work all day. We'd fish. Grandma would make us lunch. Uh, Man, I loved macaroni noodles with just milk and pepper. I loved that. Grandma made some of the meanest cheese grill sandwiches. Oh, man, it was great. We'd hang out. Grandpa would get home from work. And and again, you're young. You don't realize the the gift that was given to you because... uh, he worked as a stucco and plaster contractor later in life as a taper, uh, manual hard labor, and he'd come home from that work, and the first thing he'd do is he'd tell us, you know, Mike and Kevin, come on, let's go get, get in the boat, and he'd take us out water skiing. So we'd go out and water ski for a while, um, or we'd go out fishing, and then we'd come back in and have dinner, and we just had just a, a, a great time. We lived right on the lake right there. Well, one day, he just bought a put a brand new anchor on his boat. It was one of those, uh, I'm not a fisherman at all, but it was an anchor with, as you pulled the rope, this metal thing where the rope went through would pull up, so it just let the rope slide through and the anchor to go down. And if you wanted it to catch, you just gave it a snap, and that thing would go down and wench the rope in. Do you know what I'm talking about? Kind of, whatever. It was one of those deals. So he's sitting in the driver's seat. He just hooked up this new anchor on the front of the boat, and he's driving out in the lake, And he's testing it. But it slipped out of his hand. The rope went, anchor went down, caught on a log under the water, flipped him out of the boat. So now, what we have here is a situation. (laughs) Not a good one. We have a man in the water who's overweight, elderly, Out of shape. He's got a bad heart. This was back before they did angioplasties, angiograms, open heart surgery. They didn't do any of that then. This this was predate all that stuff. The thing they had for somebody with a bad heart was dynamite pills. Okay, nitroglycerin. So you get nitroglycerin tablets. I mean, so he's old, he's out of weight, he's out of shape, he's fully clothed, and we got a boat going in a circle. And he's out there treading water. This man is going to die. Just so happened, as he was doing that, he's yelling and yelling. And, I mean, nobody's going to hear him over the noise of the boat and whatever else. Just so happened to be across the lake, about 300 yards. And then you go up this really steep hill. There was two young guys getting ready to leave on a fishing trip. And as they were packing their their vehicle and looking out, they, they noticed they saw this boat going around a circle and they looked and sure enough there's somebody in the water they thought oh man we gotta here's the thing I, I can't I don't have pictures to describe to you and show you the thing there's no way they're gonna get there in time but they're gonna do a valiant effort they do their best to scramble down the hill undo their dock get their boat down start the boat get over there here's where the story gets very very interesting my grandpa will tell the story He says, I knew I was dying. I knew there was no hope. But I cried out to Jesus. I said, Jesus, would you save me? And he he just stretched out his hand. He said, and I saw a hand come out of heaven and grab mine. That's all he remembers. These two guys, when they got over there, they thought for sure, this guy is not going to be there when we get there. Their testimony, what they said was, we couldn't believe it. When we got there, he wasn't struggling. There was just a hand 
sticking motionless out of the water as if someone was holding it. They pulled him ashore. My grandpa lived. My grandpa believed he saw God that day. He got saved. I mean, he didn't know this word saved. He just knew that this God he always believed in was more real than he ever imagined. He started looking into it, and, and, and my grandpa, being just a regular guy, just rough and just whatever else, all of a sudden now, he, he's reading his Bible. He's curious, and he's got the daily bread on the back of the, of the, of the John. <laughs> Apologize to all you Johns out there. He's got the, you know, the daily bread, and he's reading his devotions. And, and I remember as a young kid feeling excited because when we get in the summertime, you know, the next time we were out there, um, he was the guy that signed up to ring the bell for their church. Bing, bing. It's like, hey, that's my grandpa. He rings the bell for the church. My grandpa's life radically changed. What he did was he made, he, he was also told by the Lord. He says, you have one year. When, when God saved him, he encountered him and spoke to him. He says, you have one year. Get your affairs in order. So what my grandpa did is he made an appointment with every one of his kids. And he wanted to personally share with them what happened to him, his story. He didn't want them to think that he was a religious person. He fell off and did he wanted them to know that God was real and God saved him. They wanted him, he wanted them to know that. I'll never forget the time he showed up at our house. We lived in South St. Paul. Now, again, if you can just understand, my grandpa loved my mom, but he liked, liked to just terrorize her and harass her too. I mean, he did. He, he knew he could make her feel uncomfortable. He was a rather loud guy. He was rather brash. I don't know where I get it from. Um, but he, he was loud, and, and he never knocked when he came into the house. You know, we live in South St. Paul. And he'd just come in the back door. He'd just come barging in and, hello, everybody, how you doing? You know, and he, he just was just this guy. Uh, in, in so many ways, kind of larger than life. Um, I, I'll never forget one afternoon, we're sitting in the living room, small house, sitting there, and the front door, nobody ever comes to the front door. Nobody. Do you know what I'm talking about? You got this beautiful front door nobody goes to. Right? You always come in the back door. Everybody. We're all sitting around. All of a sudden, there's a knock at the front door. We're like, front door? <laughs> what are we going to do? We should probably go there. There's somebody at the front door. My dad goes to the front door. And I'm sitting in the living room so I can see through the little alcove opening. There's a, like an like a archway little closet with a coat closet and then the front door just this little little sitting area and and i'm sitting in the living room i can i can see through and my dad opens the door and my dad is startled to see his dad standing at the front door he's standing there he's got a suit jacket on he's got a tie he's got a hat he's standing there as professional as you can imagine my dad is taken back. He's a little bit odd. Dad, are you okay? Yes. He says, can I come in? And my dad is like, well, of course. Kind of tripping over the weirdness of the whole thing. He said, well, absolutely. Dad, yeah, come on in. Come on in. So he comes in the entryway, shuts the door. And, and my grandpa says to him, son, do you know I love you? I mean, conversation never took place like that before, really. My dad is a little, even as a kid, I can remember seeing and hearing some of the awkward tones in his voice. He's like, well, dad, of course I know you love me. No, do, do you know I love you? Well, dad, yeah, I love you. Come on in. He said, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you, I saw God. And he told him the story. He said, I don't, want you to think, I don't want you to think that I'm nuts, but I want to tell you personally, this is what happened, and God is real, and he saved me. He also told me that I have one, about a year to get my, I'm going to live for a year, and I need to get my affairs in order. 
So one of the biggest affairs I want to get in order is to share with you the fact that God is real. Now, my aunt, Shirley, who lives in Seattle, Washington, you know, he did a similar experience with her. She started looking into this whole Christianity thing, thinking that you're leaving the Lutheran church. or I mean, No, he didn't leave the Lutheran church. You're, you're not talking like an average Lutheran, is what she's thinking. She's like, hey, being just a regular Lutheran was good for us. What's wrong with you? You know, you're talking about like miracles and Jesus showed up and, and God saved you and you're, what? So she started looking into it because she was concerned that maybe he was a little bubble off, you know. As she started looking into the evangelical message, the gospel message, she got saved. She just like radically changed. She shared it with her sister Betty Lou. They talked among themselves about worrying for their dad. And she got, became a Christian, accepted Christ in her heart. They invited my mom down in the conversation. She accepted Christ into her heart at their kitchen table down in St. Paul. Right, Mom? That's right. You accepted hearing the message. You're like, wow. That picture I just showed up there, uh, the last picture was how I remember my grandpa because he died. And, and I was about 10, 11, about 11 years old. And what I remember is just this kind man. That last year of his life, he was always helping out neighbors. There was a couple old women lived on the farms. Their husbands had died. And, and every once in a while, Kevin and I would be in the car. We're going to town somewhere. He says, hey, I got to stop in and check in on so-and-so. See if she needs anything gotten from the grocery store or, you know, whatever. I mean, just this, just this kind, gentle, now, guy. He died suddenly at work. Work was done. Uh, he was a taper, so he was sitting at the bench, and he was cleaning his boots. The day was done, he was cleaning his boots, had a massive heart attack, and died. It was a year almost to the day of when God said, you have one year, get your affairs in order. And he died. I, 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 like I said, I often today, I can't describe the gratitude to God. Just the, the, the humility of also realizing, why, why us, the hassle time? Why did, why did salvation come to us? We'd have been just like John Q. Public, everybody out there just living your life, doing nothing. But salvation came because of my grandpa. Now, I know that some of you hearing this, you're going to go, well, you know, it didn't have to come through your grandpa. Somebody else might have witnessed to you later in life, and you would have got saved. And it's like, yeah, I hope so. But I think about it as we were just regular people, ordinary, living our life, doing the best we can, the best you're taught, we're going along in life and, and really on our way to hell until Jesus, out of his mercy, he reaches down and he saves my grandpa. Max's words are so true. He said to me, he said, Dad, after hearing the story, he said, Dad, I've never heard this story. And then he said, Dad, do you realize the thousands of people whose lives have been changed because of grandpa? His kids all became Christians. They shared it with their kids. My dad answered the call to be a preacher. He's touched only several thousand. Two of his kids become preachers, affecting a few thousand more. And then the thousands that our lives have affected have affected thousands of others. Why? Because God in his mercy reached down in a lake in Mud Lake, Wisconsin, and reached up and saved a man. Amen. Give God thanks. <laughs> Romans, chapter 10, verses 9 through 15. I'm going to read a little bit of a lengthier passage. Parts of it you hear often. I'm going to read them together. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the Lord, the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I think about my grandpa. When I, whenever I read this verse, I think of my grandpa in that boat, just reaching up, crying out, Jesus, please save me. Then how shall they call on him in whom they've never believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. I think about the future testimonies. Your witness. Dan Pelican, where are you? Right there. Hey, Dan, I think about your faithfulness over so many years of declaring the goodness of God and his saving power. The woods, Doug and Nora, I, I think about all of the years you have so faithfully loved God unashamedly. Just, God, whatever we can do, we want to serve you, we want to make this. Think about the hundreds and thousands of lives that have been changed. Moffats, you guys drive a long way to be here every Sunday. You're raising up four wonderful kids. Your faithfulness of serving in a local church, sharing your message that others can hear the preaching of the gospel. Mike, Karen, I mean, I, I could pick on so many of you. How are they going to hear? How are they going to believe unless someone tells them? But you know something? You've been faithful in telling them. I want to encourage you. Friends, let's not let up. Let's continue to share the message. Because you never know whether that one person, even if it's an old man, how it could affect thousands. The Bible says there's one name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. One name. It's not Catholic. It's not Lutheran. It's not Baptist. It's not Episcopalian. It's not Evangelical Free, Christian Missionary Alliance, Assembly of God, Foursquare, Church of God of Prophets. It's none of those names. There's one name, the name of Jesus. People need to know of Jesus. In Galatians, Paul says, hey, circumcision and uncircumcision count for in, don't count for anything but a changed life. So you have an altar call, great. If your life doesn't change, then you really haven't met Jesus. If you get confirmed, yeah, but if your life hasn't changed, then you haven't met Jesus. If you're dunked, baptized, sprinkled, but if your life doesn't change, then you haven't met Jesus. Because Jesus will change your life. There's one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus. The Bible says to all who received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. To receive him. Well, how do you receive Jesus? Revelation 3.20. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm a gentleman. I will not go where I'm not invited. I stand at the door and knock. Any man who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and live with him. Have you invited Jesus into your life? Have you invited Jesus into your life? It starts out, it's really simple. Jesus, I acknowledge that you are God. You want to be a part of my life so badly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God, that you want you love me. I find it hard to believe you love me. And Lord, uh, if I invite you in, you're going to see some things that aren't, uh, they're, not, they're not pretty. There's some jealousy. There's some malicious, nasty things in here. So I, you guys, 
He just wants to come in. He's not going to judge you. In fact, you know what's really, what's really interesting about Jesus? He likes to clean house. He does. He likes cleaning houses. Hard to believe, but he's got a helper. It's called the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in and starts dusting off the rooms. And then saying to you and every once in a while, say, hey, um, what about this? Can that, can that go? I'd like for that to go. And, and you, you get brought up to it and you go, yeah, that can go. He's not going to take anything from you. You'll be willing to give it up. Amen? I want to encourage you. You need to tell your story. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. I see my grandpa right now in my mind's eye standing outside of the front door of our house in South St. Paul. Dressed, got a hat on, he's got a shirt and tie, his suit coat. He says, can I come in? Yeah. Dad, of course. Of course, come on in. Come on in, this is odd. Hey, son, do you know I love you? Well, Dad, of course I know you love me. No, son, do you know I love you? Yeah. I know you love me. I want to tell you something. Jesus saved me. Heavenly Father, I pray obviously for this morning that anyone who's here that has never heard your voice and opened the door, that they would do so today. Today, they would... Say, Jesus, I, I, I invite you to come into my life. I, I open the door. I, I invite you in. I want you in my life. And then, Father, for all of us to realize that the kingdom of heaven is like yeast hidden in a dough and it affects the whole dough. That we would be faithful in sharing our testimony. We'd be faithful in sharing the message, the glorious message that changes everything. That the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but you've come that we might have life and have it abundantly. The joy of knowing you. Oh, the freedom. The terror when I think about what would have happened, what would have happened if grandpa would not have met you. Where would we be today? But you and your grace rescued him. And, and, and faith came to the Hasseltine family. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Father, I pray that you'd help us to be aware of there's a lot of other families out there that are like the Hasseltines. Good people. But they don't know you. May you help us to make the message known that we could ask them, do you know I love you? And I have something to share with you. Father, we thank you. Praise God. God is good.